North America Central Command, August 1911. Message reads, All Quiet on the Martian Front. The following is read from the All Quiet on the Martian Front rulebook. Part 1. A World at War. The Martian attack of 1898 brought terrible devastation to the city of London and set the course of human history upon an altogether unexpected path. Amongst the ruins of the greatest metropolis on Earth, the Martians had, in the end, faltered and perished. Everyone knows that these invaders were overcome not by the might of Queen Victoria's armies, but by nature's own forces of disease and decay. Against these mere microbes, the Martians' superior minds could muster no defense. Where mankind had failed, the smallest and least significant of all of Earth's organisms had triumphed. Although the Martian invasion shocked the world and caused widespread panic in the days that followed, by the early years of the 20th century, many influential thinkers were eager to proclaim the aliens a spent force. These world leaders, industrialists, and intellectuals argued that the Martians had expended the last of their dying energy in a futile attempt to conquer Earth. Their case appeared to gain credibility as the years passed. Careful observation of Mars revealed no discernible signs of life. With the passing of time, the horrors that had befallen London faded from memory. Fear of further alien attack was gradually displaced by the humdrum concerns of life and commerce. It is sobering to reflect that most people were happy to accept this misguided notion, as we now know it to have been. The threat of further Martian aggression was simply too horrific and too remote to worry about. In short, the vast majority quailed at the mere thought of a second invasion, choosing to dismiss the possibility rather than acknowledge the potential danger. All over the world, only a few visionaries continued to warn that the first attack might have been a scouting foray, a precursor to a full-scale invasion. They urged humanity to ready itself for war or risk extermination. These men were commonly ridiculed and all too often dismissed as alarmists and cranks. Few even noticed the second wave of Martian cylinders that fell to Earth sometime around the end of 1908. Whether by chance or, as now seems more likely, deliberate intent, the invaders landed unseen in arid and far-flung regions of the world. The Martians established themselves secretly in places devoid of significant habitation or such aids to civilization as the telegraph and wireless. The vast empty spaces of the American Southwest, Africa, South America, Australia, and the Asiatic steppes provided ideal refuges from which to prepare an attack. As more cylinders landed in the wilderness, the aliens slowly and methodically began to construct their war machines. By the time the Martian presence came to the attention of the governments of Earth, it was already too late. The invaders struck simultaneously from their redoubts across the globe. The war between mankind and alien, the battle for Earth that we now know as the Great Martian War, had begun. That war continues to this day, more than six years on. As the year 1914 draws to an end and humanity looks to an uncertain and terrifying future. Much of the planet fell at once to the Martian attack and remains entirely under their control even now. Little information comes from these blighted lands. It is impossible to know if the enclaves of human resistance still linger in the cities of South America, the depths of Africa, or the coasts of Australia. However, it seems increasingly unlikely. As far as we know, these continents are now entirely lost to mankind. In the regions where the invaders rule unopposed, the Martian red weed spreads across the land, choking the native vegetation and coloring the mountains, jungles, and deserts a ghastly blood-red hue. Up to this present day, Europe remains entirely free of the invaders, as do the islands of Japan, much of southern Asia, and the subcontinent of India, where the Himalayas stand as nature's bulwark against the alien menace. The battle lines are drawn across the steppes of Russia, the deserts of the Middle East, and the plains of China where the gallant Japanese have taken a lead in the war against the Martians. For reasons that can only be guessed at, the Martians avoid the seas. The world's oceans remain secured by human navies, affording what is, for now at least, a safe highway for the passage of reinforcements and communications. Of the original landing sites, only North America has not fallen completely to the enemy. This is due to the endeavors of the armies and navies of the United States and the ingenuity of American industry. 
Much of the Southwest succumbed to the enemy during the initial attack, dividing the country into two heavily defended bastions, west of the Rocky Mountains and east of the Mississippi River. The war has continued ever since. Only following the two crucial battles of St. Louis in the spring of 1914 does the Martian assault appear to have lost its unstoppable momentum. Perhaps the Martians have finally reached the limits of their resources. Maybe they have retired behind the crater-like walls of their redoubts to rebuild their strength for another strike. Either way, the momentary peace is a welcome respite for the fighting men of America, and a chance to prepare for the battle to come. For the moment, at least, after six long years of war, all is quiet on the Martian front. The Invaders Following the first invasion of 1898, the remains of Martian machines were studied in great detail. Many aspects of alien technology came to be at least partially understood. As time progressed, it became possible to make an estimation of Martian scientific capabilities, of the Martians themselves, and of the red weed that sprang into growth around their landing sites, surprisingly little remained to be examined. However, the bodies of several partially decayed Martians were recovered and preserved for further investigation. Their dissection revealed much about Martian physiology as well as the atmospheric and environmental conditions that prevailed upon their planet. With the second invasion and the start of the Martian War, more specimens soon fell into human hands, affording further and more widespread study that continues with great urgency to this day. Thanks to the reporting of the war in the newspapers, everyone is now familiar with the appearance of the Martian tripod war machines. The second wave of Martian invaders brought with them a variety of machines of differing sizes, though all similar in general appearance and method of construction. The most common type stands 40 feet tall and carries a single Martian pilot concealed beneath an armored hood that looks much like a gigantic roving eye. Beneath this hood hangs a number of coiling appendages tentacle-like and formed of bands of metal both incredibly strong and dexterous. With these, a Martian can pick up even quite small objects or push aside obstructions. Besides these appendages, the tripod has two larger arms that bear either the dreaded Martian heat ray or some other equally devastating weapon. The whole machine is carried along upon three tall legs in a manner that, once witnessed, is instantly recognizable. For, while such an arrangement might be imagined to result in something resembling the gawking scuttling of a crab or some such arthropod, nothing could be further from the truth. A tripod proceeds with an elegance and ease of movement as well as a speed that, at its greatest extent, reduces the machine's image to a mere blur. To those familiar with the biology of earthly creatures, the physiology of the Martians presents a combination of the commonplace and the entirely inexplicable. The greatest exponents of the biological sciences continue to debate many important aspects of the Martian physiology and evolution. A picture is beginning to emerge of a race as far from human concerns and sensibilities as it is possible to imagine. In appearance, the closest earthly creature is a squid or octopus, though this resemblance must be understood to be superficial and purely coincidental. The bulk of the Martian body is formed of a bloated bag covered by a tough, smooth outer skin. This structure contains the creature's brain, which alone makes up over four-fifths of its weight. Internal cartilaginous compartments divide the brain into distinct globular segments, while also providing anchorage for such organs as exist within the body cavity, and points of articulation for the creature's appendages. These structures lend a roughly ovoid shape to the body itself. The Martian has few readily identifiable internal organs aside from its brain. It has no heart, no distinct digestive system, and no reproductive organs recognizable as such. Its blood vessels are diffuse and bound by thick spongiform walls, which, it is speculated, fulfill the combined functions of a heart, lungs, and digestive system. We now know all too well how Martians feed directly upon the blood and other bodily fluids of living creatures, sucking their prey dry and absorbing the resultant liquor into their bloodstream. A cursory examination soon reveals that the whole Martian physiology is supremely adapted to support the overdeveloped brain and little else. Externally, the Martian body has a pair of large, round, lidless eyes which, lacking an iris and surrounding musculature, 
maintain a fixed, death-like stare. The creature's mouth bears some passing resemblance to a parrot's beak, though the tissue is soft, yielding and enfolded. Martians appear to both breathe and feed by means of this single orifice. However, it is still unclear exactly how they breathe at all. It is possible they derive at least a portion of the oxygen they require from the breakdown of food. To either side of the Martian's mouth are two pairs of coiling tentacles. These appear to serve as a means of locomotion as well as dexterity. The low gravity and thin atmosphere of Mars means that movement there requires little in the way of strength or exertion. As a consequence, these appendages are rendered largely ineffective on Earth, with its greater gravity and denser atmosphere. Without the aid of their machines, the Martians are reduced to hauling themselves slowly and laboriously over the ground. To lift or carry any kind of load, they must combine their efforts in short bursts of activity that are followed by a period of stupor. Mars Attacks The Martian invaders crossed the cold voids of space in metal cylinders, launched from the surface of their world by gigantic cannons. As they speed through the ether, these cylinders become extremely hot. Once they land on Earth, they must cool for many hours before the Martians are able to emerge. Each cylinder carries three living occupants together with their fighting machines and the devices they need to work and survive in Earth's atmosphere. The interception of the San Antonio Cylinder in 1909 confirmed that the craft was identical to those used in the first Martian invasion in Britain. Each cylinder was designed to carry only three Martians, together with the prefabricated components of what are assumed to be three machines. The inner walls of the cylinders were themselves formed of machinery, the function of which cannot be readily determined. This undoubtedly served the Martians in the initial construction phase following landing. In addition, it is worthy of note that within the San Antonio Cylinder were found the desiccated corpses of some half-dozen ape-like creatures, the mysterious animals known to sustain Martian crews during their journey through the ether. From the examination of the original landing sites west of London, it is thought that the cylinders carried both war and other machines, and that a group of three or more cylinders comprised a coherent invasion force. Having landed, the Martians would have quickly assembled their tripod machines, since they remained vulnerable until their completion. Once they have built even a single tripod, the Martians roamed at will, and they would have established a territory that was virtually unapproachable. Next, the Martians began to build their various construction and engineering machines, and the crater formed by the cylinder as it landed was turned into a base of operations. A mining and smelting device of some kind was likely the first machine built. This enabled the Martians to refine the raw materials needed to create more machines and to continue to reinforce their landing site. The San Antonio Cylinder was unusual in that it landed alone, and for this reason it is thought to have strayed from its projected course due to circumstances unforeseen by its creators. Normally, a group of cylinders landed closely together, and once each had established itself, the Martians gathered to coordinate their efforts. Within a few weeks, the original landing sites were abandoned, and a new site established and expanded into a full-sized Martian redoubt. Redoubts were permanent bases within which the Martians constructed further machines, gathered the human prisoners on which they fed, and raised defenses that have so far proven invulnerable to attack. It is difficult to even guess the number of redoubts already built, but undoubtedly many hundreds have been constructed beyond the original landing sites, and more are being raised in the Martian territories every day. It seems likely that the individual redoubts cover a network of underground tunnels that extend far below the ground and surrounding territory. Once the Martians have begun construction, it is not long before the foul red weed spreads over the surrounding land, making even observation of their activities difficult. From the supposed location of the original landing sites and their subsequent activities, it appears the Martians have chosen to establish themselves in the least densely populated and most arid parts of the world. Indeed, they seem to find water and excessive dampness a great obstacle. Though whether they will overcome this weakness in time is impossible to say, 
The initial Martian attack rapidly established control of almost half the landmass of Earth before its momentum slowed sufficiently for human forces to offer any resistance. Although the Martians have attacked and destroyed many great cities, killing untold millions, they have also suffered their greatest reverses in battles amidst the ruins of cities such as St. Louis, Cairo, and Peking. Perhaps this is the reason the Martians have chosen to expand beyond the immediate confines of civilization, far away from the teeming urban regions of the east coast of the USA and western Europe. The Martian invaders crossed the cold voids of space in metal cylinders, launched from the surface of their world by gigantic cannons. As they speed through the ether, these cylinders become extremely hot. Once they land on Earth, they must cool for many hours before the Martians are able to emerge. Each cylinder carries three living occupants together with their fighting machines and the devices they need to work and survive in Earth's atmosphere. America fights back. Today the whole world looks to America, whose armies continue to defy the Martians after almost six years of war. From the American factories and workshops come weapons of all kinds to combat the alien menace. Guns, artillery, armored tractors, and the latest designs of aircraft, some capable of carrying a man more than a hundred miles in an hour. It is a rare week that passes without news of some new weapon or other wondrous device from the laboratories of our great industrialists and inventors. Amongst those who have turned their boundless energies to the defense of the nation are George Westinghouse, Nikola Tesla, Thomas Edison, and Henry Ford. Although still to a large extent experimental, inventions such as the latest Tesla electronic arc, dubbed the lightning gun by the newspapers, stand as a sure indication of future victory in the war for control of the world. The armies that oppose the Martians along the Mississippi and West Colorado defense lines are composed of battle-hardened troops and led by men who have been fighting the Martians for half a decade. In that time, the infantry have become expert at devising ways to overcome the Martian tripods, often by means of traps and high explosives, and sometimes by the simple expediency of overwhelming them with numbers. The infantryman is now equipped with a dust mask to protect him from the black dust and green gas. Fortresses and other defenses are armored with heat-resistant asbestos and thick layers of reinforced concrete. Even the ruins of cities become fortresses in the hands of human defenders, with numerous underground tunnels and a maze of partially collapsed buildings where troops can hide from and outmaneuver their alien opponents. The latest innovations include asbestos armored suits and armored tractors bristling with cannon. These are dubbed tanks by the troops because of their box-like bodies, which resemble the water tanks that are such a feature of the military installations that now dominate all American cities. Thank you everyone for listening to part one of All Quiet on the Martian Front. This setting is one of the main reasons I started this channel because it was a miniatures game with really fascinating lore, but by the time I discovered it, it was already dying out. Which is a shame because I love alternative history and steampunk, and this is kind of a mix of both. There is an actual book series that accompanies this rulebook called The Great Martian War, and I've been listening to it on audiobook, and Audible is releasing the next few audiobooks later this month. Which is awesome because I thought this series was completely abandoned. So I strongly encourage you to check them out and show your support for the series because I firmly believe it needs more love than it's gotten. I will have the links in the description below for you. Stay tuned next time for part two where we go over the timeline of the Great Martian War and its battles. Thank you all again. Please like and subscribe for more videos.